today, sisters and brothers, we, by the help of Allah and from the guidance of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, as exemplified and explained perfectly by the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, would attempt to take on a subject titled The Diet of God. In the Holy Quran, there is a particular ayat or verse found in the sixth chapter, the 142nd verse. Listen to these words. It says, eat of what Allah has given you and do not follow the footsteps of the devil. Surely he is your open enemy. Now when you unpack the variables of this specific or particular verse in the Holy Quran, if Allah is saying through Muhammad, eat the food that Allah said, but do not follow the footsteps of the devil, for he is your open enemy. Allah is suggesting to us that there are two types of food. There's two different ways of eating. There's two diets on the scene today. One is the diet of the devil, and the other is the diet of God. Well, today we want to expose and destroy the weakness and the impediments in the diet of the devil and edify the efficacy of the diet of God that we can find the right way and be a true follower of the supreme being. All praise is due to Allah. I'm so excited right now. We had a chance to see and hear from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan yesterday. And I got to tell you something, brothers and sisters. The minister is 87 years young, looking good, sounding good, thinking good. And I don't know about you, but it does my heart joy to see a smile on his face and to see the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan filled with so much joy, filled me with joy, and it should fill you with joy. For if there's anybody walking the face of this earth today that deserves joy in his heart, peace on his mind, comfort in his being, it is a man that's been on the battlefield for God and his Christ for over 65 years, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We are happy to see him happy by the grace and power of Almighty God, Allah. We thank Allah for his coming in the person of Master Fahd Muhammad, fulfilling that promise that was made to Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis. We learn when we were coming up in church, Reverend would always say that there's one thing that God cannot do and that is God cannot lie. This means that the Lord of the worlds always keeps his promise. That means that God's word is bond. And we thank Allah for fulfillment of his promise and for the Lord of the worlds making his word bond when he told Abraham, know of a surety, Abraham, that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs that they will serve a nation, that they will be afflicted by a nation for 400 years. But after that time that they've served that nation, I will come God talking, and I will judge the nation whom you have served, and you shall come out of her having great substance. You shall return to your fathers and be buried at a good Old age. Well, for the record, that's not talking about the goldsmiths or the goldsteins or the silversteins or the rubysteins. That's not talking about the green blats or the foxmans. This is not a prophecy that the white Jew of America or the world can claim because they are not the seed of Abraham. No, they are not the seed of Abraham. Abraham was not a white man. Abraham was a black man. 
In fact, when Abraham was in Egypt with his wife, Sarah, they thought he was an Egyptian. Do you know the word Egypt in Greek is Ieptis, which means land of the black and the burnt skinned people? Well, there's no way Abraham could have been mistaken to be an Egyptian unless he had black and burnt skin. So the first prerequisite of being the seed of Abraham is you got to be born a black man from a black bloodline. Second, second, all praise is due to Allah. Second, you got to be a stranger in a land that is not yours. And you have to be a slave for 400 years. Well, in the book of John, Jesus is having a conversation with these so-called Jews. And when he spoke to them, he told them, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Listen to the white Jews respond. They said, how should we be made free? When we have never been in bondage to any man. Well, if the prerequisite for being the seed of Abraham is you got to be a slave for 400 years, but you, Mr. Goldblatt, you, Mr. Greenblatt, you, Mr. Foxman, you, Mr. Goldsmith, you've never been a slave in a strange land for 400 years. You've never been in bondage to any man. Then the question then must be raised. What people are black? And what people have been a stranger in a land, not theirs? What people were made slaves for 400 years? And when you search the pages of history, you don't find another people on the earth. Fitting that description, better than the black man and woman of North America, we are the people of God and the ones that will receive the visit from God. So when Abraham was given this promise, God said that he's going to come himself. And after the bondage, in other words, we're being told 5,000 years in advance that we got to serve some time. We got we to serve some time, not in a little nine by nine sail inside of a prison, but we have to be confined to a 2,000 by 3,000 mile prison called the United States of America. But after that time has been served, there's a release date coming. The release date is 400 years from the start of that bondage. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the white man in his school system lied to us about the start of slavery. We were taught all of our years that we became slaves in America in the year 1619. But that is whenever the Mayflower landed. That's when the Nina landed. That's when the Santa Maria landed, but we didn't come on the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, nor on the Mayflower. We came in the holes of slave ships. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said we didn't come in 1619. We were brought here on a ship named Jesus, captained by a man named Sir John Hawkins. And we were brought to America and made slaves in 1555. They always say 1619 because they don't want to know what took place between 1555 and 1619 to us. They want you and me to think that they found black people in Africa swinging from vines with bones in our nose, savages living a jungle life. That was some, but those that they kidnapped weren't all in that category. It took them 64 years to take a proud, powerful, productive, and pious people and break us down and make us fit for slavery. So this 
64-year window of time is called a hidden history. It is the slave breaking time. It is the slave making time. It's what is called by the slave makers the mealing process or the seasoning process where they killed off most of the adults and then raised the children in, in bondage, making them think that they were born to be hewers of wood and drawers of water. And before long, ban in prayer, ban in reading. As time went on, we lost the knowledge of self. We lost our name, our culture, our religion, our moral ways, our folk ways, our norms, our God. We lost our minds. So, so this process, 64 years, is, is a hidden history. And that's why on the old game shows, they used to have a $64 question. Later on, they had a $64 thousand dollar question why not 60 why not 65 why 64 and every time the show presented the answer it was always a little known mysterious fact to win the money why did they do it it's because it's a 64 year window of time that is a little known part of history where they broke us down and made us into slaves so 1555 400 years puts us at 1955. 1955 is our out date. That's our release date. That is the time that we will be freed from this 2,000 by 3,000 mile prison called the United States of America, but not in land, in mind. Something happened in 1955. It was in 1955 that a man named Louis Walcott became Louis X, now Louis Farrakhan, came into the nation. All praise is due to Allah. It is that time. Yes, it is. We say it and don't care who don't like it. Farrakhan is Jesus. And we can prove it in no limit of time. We were blind, but now we see. We were deaf, but now we hear. We were lame, but now we walk with purpose. We were dead, but we've been resurrected from the dead. We've got to get this spooky concept of Jesus and his work out of our mind. Jesus did not walk around performing magic shows. That's not the methodology that Jesus transformed human life and healed people. Jesus spoke on 200 subjects. He made 1,900 different statements. He put his disciples on 40 missions. He gave out 41 commandments, and he told the people 41 things about himself. And do you know out of the 40 miracles that he performed, none of them were performed except for two, quote, unquote, where he actually touched somebody. Yeah, that's just two. Quote, unquote, it's really one. And that was... Uh, Peter's brother, but one time he met a man, and they give this credit for him touching someone and healing him. He met a man that is called the blind man. When Jesus met this man that is called blind, he asked the man, how do you see men? Well, wait a minute. If you're blind, why would you ask somebody, how do you see, see men? If you're blind, you don't see men, women, you don't see nothing. But the blind man didn't answer and say, 
Why would you ask me something like that? I'm blind. I don't see anything. He said, I see men as trees. What this means is there wasn't something wrong with his two eyes. But it was something wrong with his third eye. There was nothing wrong with his physical eyes. There was something wrong with his mind's eye. It was nothing wrong with his perceptibility, but it was something wrong with his perception. So it says Jesus put some spittle on his eyes. Spittle is the white foam that develops in your mouth whenever you are teaching a lecture. And after the spittle was put on the man's eyes, he said, how now do you see men? He said, I see men as they are. It wasn't spit. It was a word. Same as it was for us whenever we met the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, if we were interviewed and asked, how do you see the white man? I see the white man as a tree. What is a tree compared to a man? A tree is bigger than a man. But whenever we learn who is the original man, the original man is the Asiatic black man. The maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, God of the universe, who is the colored man. The colored man is the Caucasian white man or Yakub's grafted devil, the skunk of the planet Earth. Then whenever they ask after that, how now do you see the white man? Oh, I see the white man as he is. Oh, praise is due to Allah. In the monumental book, Our Savior Has Arrived, on page 94, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, I'm paraphrasing, he, is at, he says, little did they know as they cried out for the ship Jesus to take them back home when they first came, that it would be 400 years before that ship Jesus would come to carry them back home. The ship Jesus is not made of brick or board or nails. The ship Jesus is not a boat in the water, it's a man. And when he talked about the the minister, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said that he would get us safely across the lake on his shoulders. Well, what do you use a ship for? You use a ship to get you safely across a body of water. Well, if the man is going to get us safely across the lake on his shoulders, he is that ship named Jesus. Oh, praise are due to Allah. Oh, praise is due to Allah. Oh, praise is due to Allah. So it says that after we do our time, after we serve our sentence, our release date, and then we're coming out having great substance. The word for substance in Sanskrit is padartha, which means the how-to. Yeah, yeah, you, you, everybody got quiet on me. So if substance means the how-to, it's more of a verb than it is a noun. It's more of a process than it is a product. So when the God comes, he doesn't come to do it all for us. He comes to give us knowledge, wisdom, understanding, a mathematical theology. 
that we can use that mathematical theology in the proper terms to secure some benefit for ourselves while we are alive. Master Father Muhammad did not say, I'm going to sit you in heaven. He said, sit yourself in heaven at once. Oh, praise are due to Allah. There is no mystery God. There's a, a verse in the Bible in the book of Joshua 1 and 8. I wish Reverend would use this sometime. It says, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Listen to this. That thou mayest observeth to do according to all that is written therein, and thou shalt make thy way prospereth, and then thou shalt have a good success. We are not to wait around for the God to do it. We are to take the word that God gave us and put it into practice. So there's a how-to. Then there's two specific types of how-to that are mentioned in this promise made to Abraham of God coming to a people that was slaves for 400 years that he was going to give them. First, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Meaning, I'm going to give you a how-to, a method, a means, a program, a process that will return us back into being what we were before we were kidnapped and made slaves. Well, we don't have time to go into all of it, but simple mathematics that any time that you want to return something back to its original form is a three-step process. Number one, you have to have a prototype. Number two, you have to have a process. And number three, you have to have proof that the process works to make a duplicate of the prototype. We don't have time to break it all down, but if you were trying to restore a historic home or an antique or a classic automobile, the first thing you want to do is know what it looked like when it first was manufactured then after that, employ a process to produce proof that matches the item to make it look like what it did when it first came off the assembly line or built by the architect. Yes, Question is, what did the original man and woman look like before we fell from power and success 400 years ago? What did we look like before Yaqub did what he did 6,000 years ago? What did we look like before 50,000 years ago when our father went into the jungle of Africa? What did we look like before 66 trillion years ago when the god of moon blew the planet up and sent out a part and caused us to fall absent the knowledge of God? And when you go back, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad said beyond the 66 trillion up around that 78 trillion year mark the original people were God all praise is due to Allah so the prototype is God the process is Islam as taught by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the proof that the process works to manufacture us into the prototype is a man by the name of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and a man by the name of the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan. They are proof positive that the process works to make us like the prototype. Once again, we're going back to our fathers in peace. Number two. It says, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that food keeps us here and food takes us away. So if food keeps us here and food takes us away, then there has to be a padatha or a how-to 
eat to live in order for us to be buried at a good old age. Y'all got it. So I'm saying today that you don't need any program, any doctor, any health guru. You don't need to read and study nothing of the nutritional madness of the white man's world. All you need to have in your possession is these two books, How to Eat to Live, book one, and How to Eat to Live, book two. These are the definitive textbooks on nutrition. This is the owner's manual. This is the age reversing, disease preventing, life and life more abundantly handbook from God given to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad for the original people of the planet Earth. You don't need nothing else. Thank you for listening. I greet you. Here lies the diet of God. Y'all right. Now what's so interesting about these books, notice that these two books start off in a way that no other book on nutrition has ever started. Have you noticed that every book you read always has title, Arthur, title, Arthur, forward by. That's about you. But none of these books on teaching the science of life or the science of eating start off like these two books. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad put in bold black letters at the very top of the books, how to eat to live from God in person. Master Farid Muhammad. No other book on earth can start like that and even tries to say it's from God in person. Now, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't just make bold claims, nor does his chief helper, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, just make bold claims. They challenge the scholarship of the world to prove what they say to be a falsehood. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, once he said that if you can prove what I teach to be a lie, I will give you $10,000 out of my brother's vest pocket. At another time in the Theology of Time lecture series, he said that I will give you $20,000 an hour to just come and contend with me. And didn't nobody cash in. Where were the gurus at? Where was the Pope at? Where was the shakes and the bullas at if what he's teaching is not the truth? Challenge it and accept it. Then the most honorable Elijah Muhammad upped it a little bit. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $10,000 per word. Do you know that when you mathematically compute How to Eat to Live, book one and two, there are 113,750 words. Message to the Black Man has 110,500 words. The Fall of America has 83,525 words. Our Savior has arrived has 70,850 words. If what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught about God being a man, about Yaqub and the origin of the white race, about the mother wheel that exists and 1,500 bomber planes, about how to eat to live. If it was untrue, you could have cashed in on $3,786,250,000, but didn't nobody cash in? Because you can't prove it. 
to be alive. All praise is due to Allah. In this age reversing, disease preventing, life and life more abundantly, divine handbook from God to the original people of the planet called How to Eat to Live. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad on page one of book one says this, there is no way, there's what? No way. No way. Words matter. So teaches the Honorable Minister Louis Farcon, words matter. No way means unworkable, inaccessible, futile, hopeless, inconceivable, and unsurmountable. There is no way for us to learn the right way to eat, to live a long life, except through the guidance and teachings of Allah who came in the person of Master Fahd Muhammad. No way. All praise is due to Allah. Long life. Question is, what, what is long life? The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said, according to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, in a message titled God's Healing Power, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us that Allah has always intended long life for the righteous. What does long life look like? The most honorable Elijah Muhammad in How to Eat to Live say that this body was created by Allah to live or last a thousand years. I got three people that agree with me. Lord have mercy. Only four people. A thousand years. Do you know that from Adam to Noah, they wasn't dying at 62 and 63. They weren't dying at 74, 75. Do you know the most honorable large mama said it takes 75 years just to learn how to live? And most of us are leaving before we even learn. But according to the Bible, Adam lived to be 930. Seth lived to be 912. Enos lived to be 905. Canaan lived to be 910. Mahalalu lived to be 895. Jareth lived to be nine. I know. I don't know if that's the white race said the name. I don't know for sure. I was, I'm in public school system. I, on, I only I only speak two languages right now, and one of them I'm only proficient in one. I speak English and Ebonics, and I'm okay. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? Jareth was 962. Enoch was 365. Well, he said he walked with God and went to heaven. We did, that's a whole nother lecture for another time. Methuselah, 969. Lamech, 777. And Noah lived to be 950. This means, sisters and brothers, that the average life expectancy from Adam to Noah was 912 years. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad on page 18 of How to Eat to Live, book one, says that Noah and Methuselah ate the best foods about twice a week. Two meals a week of the best foods. Now, according 
to the dietary rule from Adam to Noah, they had accepted the command from God where they were only going to eat every herb bearing seed as meat, meaning they were vegetarian. So here, Noah and Methuselah are vegetarians that only eat two meals a week. But after the flood, people start eating meat. I can't say it for sure, but they, it sounds like a little breakfast that got involved too. I'm not, I'm not for sure on that. I'm not for sure on that, but just off these stats, it looked like some lunch had jumped into the equation, too. I can't prove it, but I'm just saying. Mathematically speaking, because Shem, he, 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 he jumped all the way from, from Noah to just hitting 600. That sounds crazy to say just 600, don't you? Our foxod made up for it. He got to 903. Salah, 433 years of age. Eber, 464. Pilar was 234. Ru was 239. Saruk was 230. You see, it's getting lower and lower. Nahon was 148. Abraham made it to 175. So the time between Noah and Abraham, the life expectancy was reduced from 912 to 317. Still hadn't started eating no pork. No hog was on the plate. But just, y'all understand what I'm saying. So how to eat to live is not only books that teach us how to eat to live and how long, but it also teaches us how to eat to live and how well do you want to live. Listen to the great master teacher, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, on page 53 of How to Eat to Live. He asks a question. He says, how to eat to live? Allah, God said to me in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever, that we who believe in him as our God and Savior should eat but one meal a day once every 24 hours. That we who believe in him as our God and as our Savior. So part of the litmus test and criterion to determine how much we believe in him as God and Savior is how well are we obedient to this one meal every 24 hours. Okay, now y'all really mad at me. It's okay. <laughs> Eat nothing between meals. Not even candy, fruit, or anything which would start the stomach digestive processes. In this way, our eating of the proper foods and drink at the proper time would extend our life to 140 years. This would protect us from sickness. He said, if we would start our infants eating one meal a day as soon as they are able to partake of solid foods, it would enable them to live to an age of 240 years. I then asked him, how about eating once every 48 hours? He said to me, you would be ill only one day out of four or five years. Surely we need a disease preventing system of living with all this madness that's going on. Fluoride in the water, chemtrails above our head, in the midst of a pestilence from heaven called COVID-19. Mix that in with them putting estrogen inside of the meat, poison inside of the, the food, devitalizing the earth's soil. Surely we need a formula to guard against illness and disease. I asked him, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad talking, what was the cure for that one day of illness every four or five years? He said, 
fast three days and you will be all right. I asked him, what about eating one meal every three days? He said, you will never be sick if you eat once every 72 hours. This is about two meals every six days, which would extend our lives to a span of 1,000 years. For there is no poison from the previous meal three days ago, which has enough power to do you any harm, the fast destroys the accumulation of the food poison. All praise is due to Allah for the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. During the time of these long livers, you'll notice that there was something missing in the environment where they live long that's present in our environment. You can read all of the translations of the Bible or the Quran you want, and you'll never see anything about McDevils in there. There was no murder kings around. No taco hells. No white casket. No sick filet. No seeing Tucky fried chicken. No trap houses, AKA Walgreen, CVS, Rite Aid. No, no trap, that's what they are, they trap houses. I mean, you can leave with some hand sanitizer and a candy bar, but it's still selling dope. That's all they do is sell dope. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said, fasting is a greater cure for all of our ills, both physical and mental, than all of the pills of this world put into one bottle or a billion bottles. You don't need the medicine from the enemy. We need the formula from God. All praises are due to Allah. The honorable minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that when Master Fahd Muhammad came among us, he emptied the medicine cabinet of the believers and threw the pills in the garbage and pointed the believer to the kitchen. He goes on to say the minister in the same message, God's healing power, he says this finely tuned magnificent creation is its own hospital. We can cure this body of any ill that it has. Listen how, listen to this boy, the minister. This is the most beautiful teacher that the world has ever seen walk the face of this planet Earth. L listen, listen to the way he breaks this down. We can cure this body of any ill that it has if the person inside the body knows how to connect with the being that created it and then makes his up of his or her mind to live according to the law of life that sustains this body so it's obedience to the dietary law that God gave us that ultimately allows us to be healed again Noah and Methuselah, not only did they eat approximately twice a week, but they also, according to page 18 of How to Eat to Live, they ate the best foods. Do you all ever remember the saying, you are what you, we've heard, we've heard. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the time and what must be done, he verified it. He said, yes, you are what you eat and even more what you think. So mathematically speaking, we are made up of what we put in our mind and what we put in our mouth. What we put in both places mixes together and becomes who we are, we are going to be. F food, the food that we eat will affect what we're going to become. The scientists of this world, they, they call this uh, nutrigenomics, which is the study of how individual genetic makeups interacts with diet. 
how it can, what you eat can either turn off or tone on, turn on a gene or modify a gene. Food is that powerful. They found through nutrigenomics that they can take the same horse from the same family with the same genetic predisposition. And one, they can let roam freely and just eat hay. And the other, they can take and regulate its affairs and train it and feed it to become a racehorse. And if they take the one from the same bloodline and discipline the diet, put it on a controlled schedule, don't let it eat just regular hay, but whole oats, corn, barley, beans, and sunflower seeds, then that horse will be able to be bigger, stronger, and, be and more agile than the other horse coming from the same family. Same DNA, but fed in a way that it activates the gene, that it enhances the gene that makes the horse more powerful that it can race. They found in nutrigenomics that the only difference between a female bee and the queen bee is that the one that they decided to make the queen while she was in the larva stage was fed in her development something called royal jelly. And by feeding the, the queen bee at the larva stage royal jelly, the queen bee grew to be three to four times the size, lives longer, and is smarter than the rest of the other bees. Not because the queen bee was born different, but because the queen bee was fed different. I wonder what would happen if the queen of the planet Earth began following how to eat to live. Oh, praise is due to Allah. They found in nutrigenomics in the 30s and 40s there was a man by the name of Dr. Pottinger. He did an experiment with over 900 cats over a 10 year period of time. Some of the cats he fed in accord with their nature which was fresh milk and raw meat. That's their nature. Other cats he fed outside of their nature with cat food, processed food, or cooked meat and evaporated milk. The first generation of those cats that were fed abstract to their own nature had decreased coordination. You, have you ever heard cats always land on their feet? Oh, it's almost true. We used to, I'm, 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 I'm just, I mean, I'm confessing. Before Islam, we didn't, you know, you don't see everything as sacred. After Islam, you start seeing everything as sacred. Because it is a creation of Allah. But before Islam, we should just take gas and just throw them out the window. That landed on his feet. Legs broke, but he landed on his feet. But after feeding the cats, the first generation outside of their nature, their coordination was decreased, their activity decreased, they slept more, became lazy, they began to develop dental problems, hyperactivity, impaired balance, poor self-defense skills, and their fur became dull. Sounds anything like a Negro, it's not a coincidence. <laughs> Second generation feeding them out of their nature. Same problems as the first generation with new ones added to it. They now had less muscle mass, smaller skulls, smaller brains, lower bone calcium, and then they began to engage in sexual perversity and reverse sexual characteristics. The male cats start acting like female cats. The female cats start acting like male cats. This is from diet. And before long, they started trying, the females tried to be with the female, male tried to be with the male. This is from diet, not genetics. 
third generation. All those problems existed. In addition to that, they had sinus problems. Skull became flat, less intelligent. Bone calcium was down to 3%, making it easy to break bones. They were always tired, had asthma and allergies, and began suffering from stillborns and miscarriages. There is and there was no fourth generation. At that point, they stopped reproducing. Tell me that you don't see all of these conditions taking place in the black community right now. We've become the Pottinger people, grafted by way of an improper diet, the diet of the devil. We've got to reverse it. And the only way we can is we've got to adopt the diet of God. Well, question is, what is the diet of the original people? What is the diet of God? I said, well, we are a people of soul, right? So naturally, I said, well, let's, you know, all the nationalities, they have different cuisines that they consider theirs. So, so let, me, let me just pull up on social media, hashtag soul food. Now, since soul is the essence of God deposited in a human being, then you, we should have seen some Bible verses and some Quran verses. But when we looked up the hashtag soul food, pork chops, greens, with the foot sticking out, chitlins, cornbread, sweet potatoes, with the mushrooms, I mean, uh, with, the, with the marshmallows on top, full of gelatin, which is the pus of a pig inside the marshmallow. Brothers and sisters, that's not soul food. That's slave food. That is a first-class plantation plate. This is what the enemy made us eat because they knew that the food we eat today will produce the person we'd become tomorrow. So if they fed us pork then to make us into a slave later, question is, what do we have to eat now to make us into a God tomorrow? We've got the formula. We got the formula from the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. They made us eat on the plantation. Swine was the staple. You remember in the movie Roots? Kunta Kinte? That whenever they came, they wanted to make, make, make him eat pork? He wouldn't eat it. Some of our ancestors were so strong against violation of the original code of ethics we had before we were brought to America that they used to have to knock out all the front teeth of a slave and then shove a funnel in their mouth and force swine in liquid form down the funnel to make sure that they ate it. Why did the slave master work so hard to put swine into our systems? It's because they know that you and I are what you eat. This pig this hog, this swine, is so dangerous and counter good health that in the Bible, in Leviticus 11 and 7 and Deuteronomy 14 and 8, God says, don't eat the swine flesh nor even touch its dead carcass. Because even touching the pig's flesh, the microscopic maggots called trichina worms, they're so small that they can integrate through the pores of the skin, go into the veins and the arteries, get inside the veins and the arteries, work their way up the spine, into the brain, eat the brain cells and eat the tissue of the eye. So don't even touch it. 
The most honorable Elijah Muhammad says in How to Eat to Live that it's even a sin to intentionally inhale hog smoke. You ever go past a barbecue spot, you'll notice that the smoke from the barbecue place is a little different than the smoke from everywhere else. Smoke from the chicken restaurant, it goes up and fades away. Is that right? Smoke from the fish restaurant, it goes up, fades away. But when you come around the barbecue spot, you got to roll your windows up, turn your air condition off, hold your breath, because just driving through it, it just, the, the hog smoke will climb out into the radiator, get out into the car, and, and you know I'm telling the truth. Why is the hog smoke go up and still come down while all the other smoke goes away? It's because these microscopic maggots, trachina worms, can ball themselves up into a protective shell, one-tenth of their size, and even survive in the smoke. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the pig has 999 poison germs in it. He said it has so much poison that a snake with venom can bite it, and the venom won't kill the snake, but the pig will turn around and eat the snake. The pig is so filthy that it has a built-in sewer system in its front legs where pus and poison drips out. So when you get that pig foot, or you get that pork and you say it's sticky. It ain't barbecue sauce. The most honorable Elijah Muhammad said that it is a grafted animal made of a cat, a rat, and a dog. Well, wait a minute. If you are what you eat, the cat, rat, and the dog, these are all natural enemies of one another. The dog chases the cat, the cat chases the rat. So in the nature of the hog is a, is a self-conflicted animal. Well, what happens to us when we become hog eaters? We become a self-conflicted people, always turning on one another. Pork, pork, public enemy number one, we gotta get it off the table. The slave was made to eat swine yesterday so that their tomorrow would produce a slave. Well, what do we need to eat today that will aid and assist us into becoming a God we're born to be tomorrow? The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, virtually all fruits are good, most vegetables, and he names a few that we should not eat. He mentions cauliflower is a very, very fine vegetable. He said we should eat whole wheat bread and we should eat pure milk. And if we buy it from the dairy farmer, no matter what the dairy farmer calls it as raw, organic, pure, whatever they say, he said we should still boil it and then chill it to drink. And then he added something to the list of what it takes in the diet of God. It's the superfood of all superfoods. There was a time whenever the, the prophet Daniel was in prison, according to the book of Daniel, chapter 1 and 11. And while he was in prison, the king had made a rule that everyone in the jail had to eat what was called the king's meat and wine. And Daniel said that he refused. I'm not eating no pork chops. I don't want no king's meat. And the God said, well, if you don't eat it and, you, and he comes and checks and you all don't look like the rest of the young men here, then, then he will take my head. So Daniel made a deal. He said, you can give the ones that wanted the king's meat for 10 days, but for me and my Nation of Islam study group, 
What? He had a, it wasn't a lot of soldiers with him yet. He had Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But while he had it in his study group, he said, all we want is pulse and water for 10 days. After the trial run was done, and those that ate the king's meat versus Daniel and his study group, when they came to analyze them, they said that Daniel and his crew looked healthier, their skin was brighter, their health, their face was healthier, and they looked like they had more vitality than the rest of the group. So they bowed and let them continue to eat it. Do you know, sisters and brothers, that the word pulse is an ancient term for the small navy bean? All oh, praise is due to Allah. It is the superfood of all superfoods. This navy bean, and I thank Allah for my brother Tariq Muhammad, a biomedical scientist of ours, that sent me some facts, some evidence. Can I tell you just a real quick self-development secret? Whatever God says to do that we're struggling with doing, study it and find more evidence on the benefits of doing it. And whatever God says do not do that we are still tempted by, study the consequences of it. And the more you learn about the reward and the benefit, the easier it is to do a hard good. And the more we learn about the consequences and repercussions, the, the, the easier it is to resist a, a, a bad thing that we might even like. It's something about knowledge. It's something about evidence on a particular thing that gives your mind a little more power. It's, it's, your, your why power begins to strengthen your willpower. The more evidence, the more why you have in your system. So when he sent this evidence, I said, we got to share this today. Y'all all right? He said and showed that the reason that they call it the Navy Bean is because it was used as a staple in the U.S. Navy during World War II when they were dropping nuclear and atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They used the Navy beam to protect them from radiation. The soldiers consumed the Navy beam because it had the ability to protect them from radiation because of its pure form of iron that's found in the navy beam. When you go to the dentist or the orthodontist to get an x-ray on your teeth, the assistant always will lay a jacket on you. Inside the jacket, it's infused with lead. The lead in the jacket is designed to protect you from the intense radiation that they're using during the x-ray. Well, the iron that's found in the navy bean is not, it's, it's made by God put in the navy bean as a method to protect us from the radiation of the planet. The navy bean also contains all nine essential amino acids. Essential meaning they must be obtained through proper nutrition and are not naturally produced in the human body. Some of these amino acids are tryptophan, which is used by the body to make melatonin and serotonin, which controls sleep, mood, and other things. Another amino acid is lysine, which is needed for the body to produce collagen, the substance that make up our gums, our lips, and health of skin. In addition to the main vitamins and minerals present in the bean, it also contains fibers and carbohydrates that keep away disease. The biggest health concerns in the black community are what is labeled as food-borne diseases, heart disease, and diabetes. 
In fact, 40% of all the deaths from the coronavirus were diabetics. And you know the most honorable Elijah Muhammad warned us about sugar. He warned us about keeping white stuff out of our mouth. White sugar, white flour, white potatoes, white pasta, white girls, white boy. Keep, keep white stuff out your mouth if you want to be healthy. Okay, back to the navy bean. The dietary fibers in the navy bean produce an environment in the human body that keeps things in line. With diabetes, the dietary fibers in the navy bean provide a low glycemic index for the body, making it slower to raise blood sugar. With it being slower to raise blood sugar, it can help rehabilitate the pancreas's ability to regulate blood sugar and the same for high blood pressure and cholesterol. This the navy bean. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the diet of God. This is the age reversing, disease preventing. This is that handbook that is designed by God, given to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad to help us attain perfect health as the original people of the planet. I thank you so much that our president, Moss Maryam, I thank the honorable minister, Louis Farrakhan, I thank all of you in the viewing audience. Thank you for sharing space and time with us this morning. I want to close with this quote from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to let you know that no matter how long and how bad we've been messing up, that we can, in fact, be redeemed. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan says this, whatever illness you have, I have or we have, if we put our faith and our trust in Allah and act in accord with his will, you can be healed of any disease. There is no sickness Allah cannot heal. So you that have any afflictions, lift your heads. Don't you go out of here thinking this is the end. This is the beginning. You make up your mind. This beautiful body is the living house of the living God. Go from this place and make up your mind. I'll never put an ounce of swill in this house of the living God ever again. Away with the cigarettes. Away with alcohol. Away with grease and grime. Filthy food. Away with fat. When you look at that fat on yourself, you're looking at a Satan that is robbing you of life. Get rid of it intelligently through proper diet. I recommend everyone get the book by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, How to Eat to Live, and then get some exercise every day. We are not taking your vaccine. This is our two-shot vaccine. How to Eat to Live, book one and book two. We don't need Johnson and Johnson. We already got Muhammad and Muhammad. We don't need Moderna and Pfizer. We already got Master Farad. Thank you for listening. I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. All praise is due to Allah.